Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to the Wonders Podcast. My name is Esteban, also known as Estacal, and today I am here joined by Retro Oliness or, or Nicholas, and we have a whole lot to talk about, just like Deadpool and Wolverine. Yeah, about a week or so now, the tickets for Deadpool and Wolverine finally went on sale, and I know I, for one, have been waiting for so long for these to go on sale, especially since I'm going to be in San Diego for San Diego Comic-Con, literally the weekend that it's out. So I was able to get tickets for San Diego, and I'm so excited. But the hype is real. Deadpool and Wolverine, uh, it, I think tickets only went on sale on AMC. And in the first 24 hours, it broke the pre-sale record for R-rated movies at AMC. And while we don't have the exact numbers, in the first 24 hours, it's estimated to have made already $8 million to $9 million in pre-sale tickets. It's honestly crazy how big the hype is for the movie. And I mean, it, like we're seeing the return of Hugh Jackman to Wolverine when we thought the last time he would play him was in Logan, which is like around 10 years ago. What are your thoughts on that, Nicholas? How, do, how was your hype for the movie? And I don't know if you got your tickets yet, but did you contribute to this record? I know you're more of a Regal guy. Uh, I'm definitely more of a Regal feller. And unfortunately, I have not yet copped my tickets for this, this latest Marvel movie. I'm definitely looking forward to it. I haven't been on the Marvel hype train since Endgame ended. I remember watching Shang-Chi, which I think was the last Marvel movie to come out after Endgame, immediately after, and I was just whatever about it. It's good on its own, for sure, but I think this movie is finally returning the MCU back to form. It's good to see Hugh Jackman return to the character, just like how a lot of people paint Iron Man or Tony Stark with Robert Downey Jr., Hugh Jackman definitely encapsulates Wolverine the best. We all grew up with the X-Men movies with Hugh Jackman starring as Wolverine. It only makes sense for him to reprise his role. And who knows, since it's all multiversal shit, maybe we'll get a new Wolverine towards the end of the movie, or who knows what it's going to set up. But I'm definitely looking forward to it, for sure. Yeah, I feel this is honestly like the juice that the MCU really needs right now. Because we've had movie after movie not do so well in the box office and then also just reviewed by fans. For me, the last movie that I had a lot of hype for was No Way Home. And for me, that was the last multiverse movie that I was really excited for. So I'm really hoping that this movie breaks away from all the bad. Because I don't think there has necessarily been a bad movie. Love and Thunder was a little rough. I still enjoyed it because I love Jane Foster. I love Natalie Portman. But... Yeah, I'm ready to go past the multiverse stuff. But I do hope that this introduces the X-Men to the MCU, the Fantastic Four, and then sets the tone for the future of the MCU. We'll see what's going on. Hopefully it breaks the mold that has existed and creates a new one, especially with a new story direction, as previously mentioned. Moving on from Deadpool and Wolverine, as previously mentioned, we have the Fantastic Four. Although we did cover it in our last episode, there's now been a new development with The Witches star Ralph, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, I might butcher it, it Innocent or Innocent as Galactus, where the cast has already been announced with Pedro Pascal being Richard uh, Reed Richards or Mr. Fantastic, Vanessa Kirby as Sue Storm or Invisible Woman, Joseph Quinn as Johnny Storm or Human Torch, and lastly, Ebon Mo Moss Bachrock Bachrock as Ben Grimm or The Thing. So it's going to be really cool to see, especially with the direction that it's, very, it's going to be a very interesting direction that they're taking the movie with Emmy winner Julia Garner as Shala Ball, which is the female Silver Surfer. Yeah, it's honestly crazy how stacked this cast is. We haven't had a, a cast this stacked since we had a fully established MC with the OG6. I know you and I have talked about it off the podcast. Can this be Marvel's Oppenheimer? Just something that's a hard-hitting story. More than what we expect from them breaking away from the formula. Because for the last few Marvel movies, they've been about the same. They were ready for the next step in that. To bring interest back into the product. Like, I don't know, just build the hype for the MCU again. Because the Fantastic Four and the X-Men are going to be the, the leading front for the MCU going forward. So we need these movies to be amazing. And Marvel is having a rehaul on, like, their writers and their showrunners. And it gives you more hope for how the state of the MCU is going to be going forward. 
now that we move past the King the Conqueror kind of timeline. Because, yeah, because there was, like, the, the Avengers movie that they had announced. But then all that stuff happened with Jonathan Majors. But I feel like we're moving past it. So I don't know. I'm excited to see what, what happens. I, I do think it's crazy that Kang is actually, like, technically a really big villain. And now we're moving straight to Galactus. And Galactus, for more context, was first introduced in the uh, original run of Fantastic Four issue from 1966, which is a godlike entity who survives only by feeding on entire planets. So it's if he had a, a, a meatball sub from Subway, but it's filled with Neptune, Mars, and Earth, right? And every living soul who inhabits the said planet. He was designed by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, and then you have Silver Surfer, who was like the herald of Galactus. In the original 2000s, Fantastic Four, with Chris Evans being the Human Torch, Galactus was one of the major plot points. Although, Galactus in that movie was really <laughs> presented accordingly to the source material. It's just to see them jump from Thanos to Kang, and with everything going on, they dismissed him almost as like a TV villain, where he, like, yes, he mattered, but not really. And then, um, you know, we have Ego, the living planet from Guardians of the Galaxy. Galactus, for sure, will definitely bring up those stakes again. But it definitely leaves food for thought as to what they're going to do in the next 10 years after Galactus. Because Doctor Strange, like, bodied and soloed Dormammu when he had the Time Stone. Ego, the living planet, is dead. Kang isn't coming back because of Jonathan Majors. And Thanos is also dead. It only leaves, like, a handful of other villains to take Galactus's place. Yes, I'm really hoping Galactus is not a villain. That should be killed. That's my biggest problem with the MCU is they will never reuse a villain like they used to. You saw Loki, he was a villain for multiple movies, or Thanos. Instead, they just have villains that could be a bigger deal just killed off. You look at MODOK, which I was really upset about because I love MODOK and AIM and all that. And there was so much potential right there. Wolf for MODOK. Yeah. But it was going to look like that regardless. I feel like because it's a flowing head. With little arms and little... I feel like it was going to look like a Spy kid Or like a Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Uh, Mr. Electric? Like that. I thought it was going to look like that. I really hope... My biggest wish of this Fantastic Four movie is that Galactus, unlike the last iteration of him in the Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer movie, he's more than a cloud. I want to see just a giant man in a purple and blue suit really go into the comic world. And that kind of atmosphere, go away from trying to be realistic and this realism and just embrace what you are. You're a fantasy kind of um, movie. We should try to experiment. You're only limiting yourself. And most often than not, the stuff in the MCU that really works is the stuff that's experimental, not the stuff that is just reoccurring and formulaic. Yeah. Best of luck for the movie and uh, runners who are starring in this. And it's, it's definitely a, a stacked cast. But hopefully it's, it holds up in the box office and critically. Yes. Leading on from that, another Marvel movie, but it's not connected to the MCU. It's another movie that is actually coming out this year. That's coming out this year is Venom The Last Dance. There's actually a trailer that's coming out the day after we filmed this. On June 3rd, there's a trailer that's supposed to come out. This is confirmed as the last Tom Hardy Venom movie. We have a lot of mixed feelings about that just because selfishly we just want to see spider-man and venom be on the big screen together again and we had that tease with tom hardy's venom licking the screen in that one spider-man post credit scene and then we just kind of never got a payoff from that and then he just got ticked out, taken out of the mcu so i honestly don't know what this movie is going to be about i heard rumors that i saw something go on twitter that it was talking about a possible storyline for this and they were hinting at, oh, since Venom is connected to the Hive Mind and he was in the MCU and he knows who Spider-Man is, that he's going to be looking for the Spider-Man of his universe. But then beyond that, I don't know, because if it's not going to continue after this, I don't know how they're going to do it. Like, how are you going to do another Venom movie without Spider-Man? Because, like, I, I like the symbiote villains, but I've also gotten enough of the symbiote villains. CGI like, fights for him. Yeah, like... I did Let There Be Carnage, but not as much as the first one. The first Venom movie is really good. And Let There Be Carnage felt so... It was way too fast-paced. I feel like it was mi missing, like, kind of the third act. 
And then also, it, it makes no sense that they killed Carnage so fast. And see, that's going on from what I was saying about the MCU, what the MCU does is killing off its villains without letting them create a reoccurring antagonizing structure. Yeah, so Venom came out. That was back in 2018. I introduced Venom without Spider-Man. And then the sequel came out in 2021 with Cletus Cassidy and Carnage into the mix with the direction from Lord of the Rings actor Andy. So with The Last Dance, according to IGN, it says that it, it's going to pick up where No Way Home is apparently or something like that. Yeah, so when he gets back to the universe. So he remember, he's at the bar and then a piece of the symbiote breaks off in the MCU before he could even meet Spider-Man. Yeah. To be honest, I don't really have a lot to say. Except for, because if it's good, if it's going to be a, a, another self-contained adventure story. It's, it's going to be another installment in the mix. Like the best way to equate it to something that our viewers, our listeners could understand would be like Call of Duty 10. We had 7, 8, and we have 10 now. It's coming out, but no one's going crazy bonkers over it. At, at least not in, in mass. I, I hope that they... I mean, who knows? Maybe in the third one, they're going to do some crazy thing and introduce the King in Black. But I, I think that in itself would be another trilogy. I think if they were to throw that all into a single movie, it'd be over the top and rushed like Zack Snyder's Justice League in one movie. But who knows? Yeah, the cards are on the table. But for me, this movie is just going to be it's another box office filler. Yeah, it's just the Spider-Man, uh, them getting their property out. Yeah, it keeps the uh, rides. I'd still prefer this over like a, a Madam Web though. Because I sure. actually love Tom Hardy. I I love Tom Hardy's Venom. And I'm honestly so upset that it's this is how it's gonna end without him having that payoff that we all wanted. Yeah, I do I understand that. And something that we are looking forward to delving into is the Spider Man Noir live action series that's gonna be on MGM Plus and Amazon Prime starring Nicolas Cage. And it's going to be cool, although it's going to be crazy to think about that it's going to be live action with Nicolas Cage, who isn't really necessarily in his prime anymore. It's going to be cool to see him donning the Spider-Man title as well. Although he did lend his voice to the two recent animated Spider-Man movies. It's going to be interesting seeing Cage jump around. Do you think it's going to be in the 50s or 40s? or? Oh no, it's going to be 1930s New York. Yeah, 1930s, yeah. yeah. I was just about to say, according to this uh, Variety art article talking about Kevin giving a log line of the show, it talks about how Noir will tell the story of an aging and down-on-his-luck private investigator in the 1930s New York who was forced to grapple with his past life as the city's one and only superhero. So I, I am so excited for this because <laughs> for a while now we've heard about them doing a, a Spider-Man Noir, like a live-action series, and I was just like, I was like, man, I cannot imagine anyone else but Nicolas Cage doing this because of, like how you said, the Spider-Verse movies. So I'm so excited for this. And I hope it's all told in, like, obviously it's going to be black and white because it has Noir in the name. Uh, but man, like, I just love time pieces like this, like just movies that are set in the past that kind of encapsulate a certain time period. Um, so I'm so excited for this. And, and while I do agree with you that he's not really in his prime, you know, that's fine, though, because he's, like, a mass superhero. So, like, he could get away with doing none of the stunts, but we're going to, you know, believe that it's him because we're not seeing his face. True. So I'm honestly so down for this. I did read the Spider-Man Noir comics, so it, it's going to be... Because here's the thing. Spider-Man Noir, like, he, he uses guns in his superheroing, which is really interesting to see, whereas Peter Parker doesn't use guns. And his trench coat and whatnot. Yeah, he, he carries like a M1911 or some form, some pistol. And I believe he shoots and kills the Green Goblin of that universe. And he puts people down permanently. So you could consider him the anti-hero by definition because he kills. But I wonder if he's still going to be like his goody two-shoes. But it's just going to be him holding a gun. Or if they're not even going to use a gun. Or if, sorry, if Nicolas Cage is... The Spider-Man Noir is not ever going to use a gun. Because in the Spider-Verse movies, he never used one. Even though that's one of the biggest differences between his Spider-Man and the Peter Parker or the Miles Morales Spider-Man. Like, every Spider-Man has its own thing. And Spider-Man, besides being from the 930s, is that he uses a pistol when he fights. You think they're going to incorporate that into the show? Like, what are your predictions? How do you think they're going to roll it out? So, I feel like it's... I don't think it's going to be a staple of this character. But I do think that there is going to be maybe one or two instances where he does use a gun. 
May maybe not because realistically, I feel like they're not going to show him kill someone. I feel like they're going to show him like shoot someone and then like just down and then he like interrogates them or something like that. I do what, the one thing I want to see is him punch a Nazi because I, they like talk about that in the Spider Verse movies. And I know while this isn't or at least it hasn't been confirmed if it's that version of Spider Man Noir, you know, I still want to see that in live action because I think that's amazing, you know, because we always have like. Like, you look at the first, I think the first issue of Captain America where he's, like, punching Hitler. Yeah, like, I don't know. I just want to see that in live action. I think that'd be amazing. Even if it's not Hitler, it's just a, a Nazi. I think that'd be, that would make me happy. Yeah. So, I, as I was looking through Marvel Unlimited, there's also other characters that were uh, given the noir storyline. Like, there's Wolverine noir, Daredevil noir, Punisher noir, Iron Man noir, X-Men, Luke Cage, Fantastic Four, but I mentioned them already. So maybe you get like Easter eggs from that sh from those other comic book franchises as well. It's just you know there there isn't like too much details other than the fact that Nicolas Cage is starring in this show. Responding to like what you were saying uh, about all these different versions of noir characters, they could honestly do so many different. I mean, if Marvel gave the rights to Amazon, they could honestly do so many different series, noir series. Or just like set maybe even in, in a connected universe or just like on its own separate thing. Because I know like Spider-Man Noir's thing is that he's the, the only superhero. So like they could honestly do like a Wolverine Noir and Iron Man Noir. Like just like its own things that are separate from the MCU. And then just like, I don't know. Because I, especially since it's made by Amazon, you know, I'm just like looking at the boys and I'm like, there's so many things they could do with it. So I am excited for like kind of the possibilities of what going to come of this and if it's going to be like a one-time like season and series or if it's going to be like some kind of long-standing thing and then i'm also wondering who the villain is going to be i hope it's green goblin because i just want to see another version of green goblin in in some way shape or form have you seen how uh punisher noir looks like dude he's he's crazy he's got like it's just him in a suit wearing a trench coat and he has like a skull mask. Ro oh, Rorschach. I just I just looked at it. That's so sick. Yeah. It literally is like like Rorschach from Watchmen. Yeah, that's actually so. <laughs> I, I would love a Punisher noir show. For real, I'm always down for more Punisher. Too bad they killed him in the comics and the, the regular continuity. It's whatever though. But yeah, I mean, uh, uh, moving on from the 1930s to the 90s, X Men '97, the first season has finally wrapped up, and uh, although S uh, S S hasn't gotten there yet because he's binging of the original 90s series he he, yeah, he knows forever. He, he knows all the lowdowns on the on the easter eggs on the final episode and what that could tell for the foreseeable future yeah while i can't say what happens in x-men 97 because i don't know the story i do know like the cameos and how it shows spider-man from the 90s animated series which is my all-time favorite iteration of spider-man and it, it shows him like just like briefly in one scene jumping away from explosions and then in another episode the final episode standing next to mary jane which is like a continuation of a cliffhanger from the original spider-man animated series where he loses mary jane and then we never got out to that we never knew it was able to rescue her so i am so hoping that we get a continuation show similar to x-men 97 with spider-man in this universe because man especially with the animation that x-men 97 has the only thing that was limiting the 90s animated series for Spider-Man was the animation. It didn't let him show off his fighting style that much. So I feel like having a show with this new kind of animation would just be amazing. And I hope that it leads to... Because they've teased bringing it back and doing a continuation series. And I want to see all that with the other characters they've teased, like Daredevil. They even teased like Doctor Doom. I just want to see all these characters come back. And I'm so down for them to do a connected universe from all the 90s shows and i just want to see what comes of this i don't know what are your thoughts on this i think it'd be cool seeing more 90s properties come back and that'd be their own you know, like separate little universe i think it would be funny knowing that peter parker is from new york seeing how you know it's in decade right after in the very beginning yet the 9 11 so my first thought is like what would spider-man do or like how would they write or would they even include 9 11 just i don't know just a silly thought but otherwise... For a kid's show? I don't know if they would do that. Uh, yeah, but have really... you ever seen the 9-11 comic? Where I've seen like little clips, little panels of it. But they do show the 9-11 event happening in the comic universe. And kind of showing Spider-Man contemplating. He's just like, I could have stopped this. And, 
you know, having to grieve and trying to help firefighters uh, rescue people. And it shows like different heroes and like even villains uh, try to help out to this kind of um, event that happened, you know, showing like humanizing them a little bit to, I don't know, to kind of like ease real life, a real life tragic event. Yeah. But uh, aside from 2000s, if we're so solely focused on the events of the final episode of the first season of X Men ninety seven titled "Tolerance Is Extinction" Part Three. Um, you know, as Estevana mentioned, there are you know it's Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson standing uh, in front of a store uh, TV store window, looking down at the events unfolding regarding the X Men. It's going to be interesting to see if they choose to bring back the uh, Amazing Spider Man ninety series or whatever is or what was it called again. It was called The Amazing Spider-Man, right? Or it's just Spider-Man? I think it was just called Spider-Man the Animated Series. So the Spider-Man, the, so if they brought back the Spider-Man Animated Series, if they were to do anything, they would have to address the controversial choice of of having Mary Jane standing next to Peter Parker because the original show ended off with him finding Mary Jane or not finding Mary Jane yet because, what is it? Because after five seasons between 1994 and 98, before being canceled by Fox, uh, according to IGN, the series ended on an unresolved cliffhanger where Madam Web offered to help Spider-Man find the real MJ after getting duped by a clone. And of course, with X-Men 97's final uh, episode, they do show that he does indeed find Mary Jane. We just don't know how. So they could either do something like that where they, they continue where they left off, or they just do an entire episode where they just catch everyone up to speed to the events of X-Men 97 from Peter Parker's perspective. Overall, it'll be a cool thing to see come back. People are urging and have been wishing for something like this, such as, uh, like, for example, es- uh, Esteban. Oh, look. I, I, I gotta say, I mean, I've kept up with X-Men 97 all the way until the final ep- uh, episode of its uh, first season. There's more seasons, of course, being slated to release. Uh, continuing X-Men 97, maybe it's just gonna be called X-Men 98. Who fucking knows? <laughs> But it's going to be cool seeing uh, if they continue doing an amazing... I mean, if we could uh, continue doing a Spider-Man animated series return. But yeah, it de- definitely, it's going to be interesting how they're going to tie up everything in the very beginning. Or if they're going to just continue the show. Yeah, either way, I'm always down for more Spider-Man. So, <laughs> I, like I said, I'm, I'm down for a reboot. Not a reboot, a continuation. And yeah, and then talking about reboots or new continuations looking towards dc studios with its new superman movie that was first called superman legacy and now going back to just superman we finally saw a first picture of the new suit so what are your thoughts on that i frankly think the suit's kind of a banger i think maybe it's like young superman before he gets the official suit maybe that's fleeting thought maybe this is just the actual suit seen in a more realistic setting or context which is cool too. I'm fine with it. I'm glad that the return of the red underwear is back. That's how you know he's going to be a good Superman. I think the last time the Superman outfit kept it to close to the original was with Brandon Routh when he donned the cape back with Superman Returns. I, I generally enjoyed that movie. I thought, the, I thought the Superman outfit then was great. And it's cool seeing the underwear return. Um, I, I dig it. There's a lot of speculation about what the movie could be about. According to comic book, they say that Superman will tell a story of Superman's journey to reconcile his Kryptonian heritage with his human upbringing as Clark Kent of Smallville, Kansas. He is the embodiment of truth, justice, and a better tomorrow, guided by human kindness in a world that sees kindness as old-fashioned. Which I definitely do think it's really good to see, since the origin of Superman, who is actually my favorite superhero, is that it's all about that representing the best parts of humanity whereas the past couple supermen that we've seen in media across video games animation and live action have all been like this the superman where he's either evil he's a communist a fascist or like he's good but he's like also really mean and evil on the inside or has the capacity to be evil whereas the original superman has always been intended to rise above though those negative thoughts and definitely is in some instances seen as a Christ-like character where he sacrifices himself for the betterment of humanity 
in many comic book runs. The most notable one being where he fights Doomsday and dies. Yeah, and then also adding on to what you were saying, I also feel Superman being a villain or being made out to be a villain in like all this recent media has oversaturated the character with such a negative kind of image. Because now you think about Superman, you think about injustice. You think of Superman, you think of the recent Suicide Squad game. But you don't think about the, the core values of what makes Superman the character that he should be in the comics. So I am really excited for this. I do hope it has more story for him as Clark Kent rather than just as Superman. And we see his life and like how he balances everything. And as for the suit, I actually really like the suit. For real. Uh, I love the boots. I love the texture of the suit. I think it's like his first iteration of the suit. I think he's going to eventually get a different one. I am a huge fan of the collar. Overall, I know it's made by the same designers who, who designed the um, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 suits. So I am really excited for that. Uh, I love, like I said, the textures and like how you said the red trunks. Honestly, I, I didn't notice how much I missed them until I saw this picture. I am really interested in what's going on in the background of that picture. Because like that kind of looks like maybe Brainiac. That's where my head goes or my mind kind of uh, gravitates towards. That's crazy, bro. Wow. Hey, yeah, but I don't know. You... Brainiac at the very, like in his first movie, like Brainiac is like end game, like experienced Superman type shit. That's what I'm saying. But like, I don't know what else could look like that. I don't know. Maybe they might do a callback to the Superman animated series where he first meets Brainiac. Well, they could do that. Like introduce Brainiac as like a weaker version and then have him eventually turn into a main antagonist for the whole DCU. Cool. Like, like, a, like, like Ultron type thing. Yeah. Show him. In the beginning, they beat him, and then he just comes back and just keeps doing that. I am really excited for this movie, though. I'm really hoping that the DCU is able to, like, actually succeed. Because I love these movies, and I don't know, man. I just don't want to see another reboot. I just want it to continue and to have one consistent timeline, one consistent story. So, yeah, this this movie has a lot riding on it. Yeah. And, yeah, and I can't, I can't imagine what would happen if this movie failed. Yeah, that would suck. Especially that would be like a big blemish on James Gunn's uh, repertoire, n known for making one of the best Marvel trilogies in existence, which is the Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy, you know, within the MCU. Yeah, like there really hasn't been a bad property made by James Gunn. You look at Guardians of the Galaxy, you look at Peacemaker, which is one of my favorite shows. You know, every time Boy's in the booth, it's just, it's, it's fire. He's cooking. So... I'm hoping this is another banger. Yeah. I'm hoping he doesn't have too much going on, James Gunn, because he is at the helm of DC Studios now. So I hope it's not too much going on and it takes away from the story. But I am more optimistic for the DCU now than I've ever been. Rounding out the the rest of the cast, you have Lewis Lane being played by Rachel Brosnahan, Perry White by Wendell Pierce, Sarah Sampaio as Eve Testermacher. Man, I am butching these. Terrence Rosemore as Otis, Maria Gabriela DeFaria De as Angela Spica or The Engineer, Isabella Merced as Kendra Sauter, Saunders or Hawk, Hawk Girl, Eddie Gathigy as Michael Holtz or Mr. Terrific, and lastly, Anthony Carrion as Rex Mason, Metamorpho. Just to highlight some of these casting choices or characters that they're playing, it's cool seeing a girl make her entrance into the live universe of DC. Although she is technically one of the members of the Justice League in the animated series, she never showed her face in the Zack Snyder verse of the DC. One of the characters I am definitely looking forward to seeing is Rex Mason's Metamorpho. I think Metamorpho is a really cool guy. When he was introduced in the animated show called Superman the Animated Series, he was definitely like this misunderstood guy who was a goody two-shoes, good-looking classic jock farm boy cool guy american face and then as he turned into metamorpho he had this anti-hero stance and later became a member of the justice league as a superhero so although this is technically a movie that introduces superman it's definitely going to be something to see how james gunn is going to incorporate all of these other heroes or casting choices as well yeah i was the, the person who i'm most excited for is to see hawk girl in live action because one thing I did like about the movie Black Adam, which wasn't that good, was Hawkman, Hawk Girl's other half. Like, I just 
visually he was just so it was amazing like he was to me the best part of the movie so i have really high hopes for the hawk girl and i just can't wait to see that in live action and to see all these for a superman movie to actually have good side characters yeah there you go we'll see what goes on but now switching from the as as always we talk about movies and shows and then we talk about video games so we talked about movies versus shows this time but moving on to the digital sphere into uh the gaming world we have uh a little bit of food for thought regarding furiosa being the latest mad max property in theaters right now please go watch it's a generally good movie you have uh george miller the director of mad max claiming that the last mad max game that came out wasn't as good as he wanted it to be which is interesting because you could see in the mad max furiosa premiered you saw hideo kojima hanging out and about and george miller stated that he would really like it if hideo kojima made a, a game in the mad max universe which i mean granted hideo kojima is just a master a director when it comes to video games you know that that's his thing it's his cheese and i would definitely like to see that as well although some people have attacked or responded to george miller's thoughts such as a christopher sunberg who was someone who worked on the last Mad Max game saying, this is complete nonsense and just shows complete arrogance. They did everything they, they could to make this a complete linear game after having signed up with the developer of open world games. I'm sure Hideo Kojima would make an awesome Mad Max game, but it would be a completely different experience. So if you were to envision a Mad Max game directed by Hideo Kojima, even though that in itself is a wild card and, and basically unpredictable, how, what how, what would you like to see in the next Mad Max game? Or, yeah, essentially that. Okay, first of all, I know very little to nothing about Mad Max. You and, you and I have talked about it. We're, like, planning on watching them. You know, from what I interpret from what I've seen, that I would expect, like, an open world game that has you being able to go in and out of cars and fend off against all these other raiders. I'm hoping I'm, I'm not butchering the story because I don't know that much, like I said. But, yeah, I would just assume that, that it would be something that you can go in and out of places and then just unexpectedly run into other people and go through maybe the stories of the movies if not maybe its own independent story within the existing continuity yeah i definitely fuck with the story it's like the opposite of water world where everything is submerged in water in this place it's water's just practically gone it got too hot the water's gone and society is corrupted and then what's left is people basically choosing to fight trial by combat to the death with cars so it's like death race starring jason statham but open world mad max is someone who existed as a police officer or in law enforcement prior to the world going to shit and everything being torn from him he now roams the desert as a main figure for making his name in the wasteland in other words without trying to spoil the movies for, for that start it's a good watch it's a solid trilogy and with the I, th I believe fury road is a prequel starring tom hardy uh, if people haven't i would also recommend watching that one it's good it's a good movie it also branches off and talks about furioso which is a new character in the continuity who it has a, a prequel right now in theaters which you should go watch i, I think it'd be cool because you could go into the psychology of mad max like how much the combat affects him you know, his disconnect from, like, his inability to connect with people because every time he does, he loses them. And it, like, it really fucks him up. There, there's many different angles you could take with Mad Max, especially with Hideo Kojima. You, could, you can go crazy with it. But moving forward from Mad Max to things that we wouldn't like to see uh, come to fruition, EA Electronic Arts is reportedly considering implementing more in-game ads in their AAA t titles. This was something that they talked about in their recent earnings call, according to the studio's CEO in this Gamer article I have pulled up. Personally, I, I think this is an interesting maneuver and especially something to vocalize as EA has always had in-game ads in their AAA titles. As we were storyboarding this episode, EA had, over time, put lots of ads in their games, especially in one of their Need for Speed games. Obama, back when he was running for office, either for his first term or his second, had a, a billboard on one of the Need for Speed games where it said, like, early voting has begun. 
voteforchange.com. And it, it, you can see his face plastered on that on that billboard in the game. So maybe they're talking about that, or maybe they're talking more uh, about the, excuse me, as how they could further monetize the games they're already developing or are going to develop. But when you hear that they're going to implement more in-game ads in their AAA titles, Esteban, what, what comes to mind in your head? Uh, so <laughs> my biggest games like, like you said, a Need for Speed or a Forza, those games that are notorious for having advertisements within them, like that's honestly pretty fine to me. I don't mind that. What I'm scared of is like it going to more like the fantasy games, like the Star Wars, like the Dead Space, because that would seem so out of character and take me out of that immersion. If I'm like, let's say in the next Fallen Order game, the third of the expected third one that's going to come out, sequel to Jedi Survivor. If I saw, let's say, an advertisement for a soda that's exists in real life, that would take me out of the whole thing. And that would just turn into a meme. So I hope that it is used in a strategic way that's not detrimental to like the illusion and the immersion of the game. But yeah, no, I'm honestly fine with it. If it's like a game that's based in a real world setting, doing like real world activities. So like, like how FIFA does, the WWE 2K games do, the NBA 2K games do. All these games do that, and I'm honestly fine with it. It's just, I just hope there's kind of some kind of limitation to it. Definitely. In the, in the same game rent article, they, they stated that an update to The Sims 4 earlier this year featured an aggressive ad push within the game, adding a shop button to the game's user interface that encouraged players to buy the newest expansions. They also received a lot more criticism from their fans for its in-game ad practices featuring heavy advertisings in their sports games and even retroactively placing ads in games like UFC 4. Then a new statement re released by EA CEO suggests that the company is looking to push in-game ads even more, right? According to Andrew Wilson, EA CEO, he, he stated that EA was looking for thoughtful implementations of in-game ads within the studio's new games, suggesting that work on the new ad policy was still early. The CEO did, however, express more excitement at the potential for greater advertisements outside of the games. It's going to be very interesting to see that, especially with their previous run of single-player games being critically panned positively, such as Jedi Fallen Order, Survivor, and the sci-fi horror remake of Dead Space. It's going to be interesting to see if they were to monetize games such as Battlefield. I think the way they should bring it back would be like the Battlefield 5 system. With the addition of a battle pass, obviously, because every game has to have a battle pass. Battlefield 5 offered the players the ability to customize their own shoulder by uh, changing the head, the face paint, the torso, and the legs. So you, I think mix and matching sets would offer players the same level of personalization as one would do in Fortnite. It's something that generally appealed to me, and it's definitely something I dropped a lot of uh, cold hard cash on. Whereas in Battlefield 2042, which was the next iteration after, many, just like me, chose to instead have an operator system with named characters. And all you could do is buy skins for those specific characters. And it, that was something that a lot of people didn't like, such as myself. And are really hoping that the next iteration of Battlefield chooses to abandon, for the most part. It's very normal for things, although I can't really speak on the sports side of things when it comes to their games. Because I don't play sports titles let's just hopefully with the way they do introduce ads in those games that they do so in them that's not invasive where it takes people away from what they're there to do which is ball up or shoot goals or kick each other's asses like in ufc4 but moving forward for monetization onto things that a lot of people will definitely uh, look forward to buying it's the new season of fortnite so what's so interesting about the new season the new season what makes it really interesting is it has a Mad Max appeal and also merging with uh, Fallout. So like the new Battle Pass, it it has a lot of different things from Fallout. So there's like about like maybe three or four different power armors you can get. There's Nuka-Cola in the game to help you heal and get shield. And then there's even like a special weapon, which I have yet to see while I'm playing. But it's a weapon called the Tri-Beam Laser Rifle which is a really famous gun if you play the Fallout games. But yeah, what's really special about this season is the new additions to the driving mechanics. You know, because for the longest time, Fortnite has had cars, but what makes it different 
is that now there's car power up so you can get like a grenade launcher or a you know um, like a gatling gun or just like a turret for your car you can get bulletproof tires just like things like that like it's all these upgrades and changing the way that the game is played so it's more like car centric to go with Mad Max theme and the kind of open world wasteland kind of theme so what are your thoughts on that yeah the, definitely the new season with the fallout themed uh battle pass follow suit with the fallout show being released and it seemed like just the cyberpunk edge runner show that was successful bringing a lot of people towards the cyberpunk 2077 game it seems like this show's success has brought not only a lot of people back to the older Fallout games that existed from 76 and below, but it's definitely a spur of Epic Games of all people to launch their season in accordance to the show, or better yet, to the games following the popularity of the show. It's cool to see that they chose to do the T60 power armor, although I, I would have been nice seeing other power armors included in the game, and, and it would have been nice seeing the Vault Boy be a skin available but because uh, you have a bonus skin that's always unlocked from the middle of the season or towards the middle of the season. And to my knowledge, it hasn't been revealed yet. But who knows? It might be different. Hopefully, it's the NCR Courier outfit. That would that would definitely be badass to see. I think it's cool that it's Mad Max-esque, as we just talked about Mad Max earlier. One of my biggest problem with that statement is that Mad Max himself isn't really in the season himself. It's desert-themed. Cars are beating the shit at each other with guns. There's cow catchers, bulletproof tires, insane ramps, nitrous. But yet, the car warrior himself, the road warrior himself, Mad Max, is not in the season. He's not in the shop. He's not an unlockable skin. There hasn't been any mentioned, hey. except for wishful thinking regarding Mad Max. As just like how you would like to see Mad Max, another property that would fit perfectly in the season would be Twisted Metal. Are you familiar with Twisted Metal? So I have heard a lot because of you. <laughs> and, you know, you told me that it would be perfect for this season. And the seasons usually last a couple of months. So honestly, I feel like I wouldn't scratch out a, a Twisted Metal kind of collab sometime soon. Especially with how often these collabs are happening with Fortnite. Look at the Lethal Company one that's taking place right now. With the skin and the dance. Honestly, I wouldn't rule it out. And for your sake, I hope they do bring it. Because I know that you would instantly buy it. Oh, I would, for sure. If I were to see Mad Max, I would like to see them add the Road Warrior with him with his battle jacket and the, the game's game. version of Mad Max. Or maybe the Tom Hardy version with him with just his, like, shirt. And maybe they would add a Sweet Tooth and any of the other characters from Twisted Metal. Because Twisted Metal also comes with its own vehicles that would be perfect to sell in the, the, uh, the uh, item shop. But yeah, a lot of people have complained about the latest season as well regarding the meta being cars. Although Epic released an update adding things like boogie bombs, which uh, take people out of vehicles. So they're like a good way to counter said other people being road warriors themselves. But yeah, it's cool. Any final thoughts? Just that I do, like you said, I'm really like so curious why they didn't do a vault boy or like a vault suit skin. I'm assuming that's going to come later on. But I do hope they do that because Call of Duty is also doing a Fallout collaboration and they have the vault suits. So I don't know. I hope they do that. But aside from that, honestly, this season has been really fun. I did get to play a bit of it. I do the cars. They were nerfed, which I'm so happy about because they were a little OP. But all the new mechanics, I'm so down for it. And the power armors, I'm grinding for them. I do wish they added the Enclave power armor because that was like my favorite. But yeah, no, I'm just ready for more Fallout content <laughs> because of the new show. Yeah, I understand that. But besides the new Fortnite, the new Fortnite season, it seems like a returning game has come back with its own season and its own titular characters, such as Multiverses. Are you looking forward to Multiverses? Or are you thinking about playing the new one or its return? Yeah, so I actually played it the first go around, I think when it was in beta. And this new update that they are like season comes with a free battle pass. And you even get, they added some new characters. Most notably, and the one that I really want to play as, is Jason Voorhees. I'm a big Friday the 13th guy, because I love horror movies, and especially classic horror movies. They added Jason Voorhees. They added Agent Smith from Matrix. And they even added The Joker, voiced by Mark Hamill himself. I'm actually, like, really curious to try out the game, and to see how the gameplay has improved, if any, and to see the kind of changes they've made since the beta. 
What are your thoughts on it? Are you going to play the new the new season? I'm probably, to be honest, I was on board with it at the very beginning with the beta, but as uh, time has gone on, I, I've lost interest in the game. And the game overall has evolved vastly different from what the beta was. For example, according to IGN, the player first game stated that they increased the number of high value items in both the free and premium tiers by adding more ring outs, character variants, and currency in their battle pass. Now you can earn the premium currency called Gleamium through both tiers, which can be used to buy various in-game items, whether it's for new characters or saving to use towards the next season's premium battle pass. Of course, the first uh, character you can unlock in this battle pass is Jason Voorhees, and it's couldn't be really cool seeing that. And other changes to the game or additions is that they're adding prestige. There's a prestige currency that rewards players for all the items and cosmetics they collect for their favorite fighters. Each cosmetic item you get uh, awards its own prestige currency value based on type and rarity. The developer stated as well that when they launched, all returning players will receive an allotment of prestige currency based on the number of cosmetics they acquired during the open beta as a reward for all previous purchases and unlocks. There are four separate virtual currencies to the free-to-play brawler instead of just having one throughout the main thing. One of them being the gold currency, which previously was available, which doesn't exist anymore. Player first games said it will dish out commemorative cosmetics that correlate to a player's gold earned during the open beta. These are exclusive items that can't be earned any other way. And finally, player first games will reset all perks from the open beta. Perks are now unlocked using the perk currency attained through playing the game, and all players will receive an allotment that correlates the number of perks unlocked from the open beta. I don't know if I feel like that's really something that is something I'd be willing to sit down and grind for. And last but not least, as Savannah's mentioned, there is Jason Voorhees in the game right now. Agent Smith will be coming out. And so is the Joker, I believe, is also in this season. Other characters that I saw that were notable were Rick and Morty, of course. So yeah, I mean, I don't have much to say. Some people might call it a Smash clone and might get back into it. But personally, it was just a game that I played, experienced, and hopefully others are willing to enjoy. Yeah, I would say I would consider checking it out if I ever have, like, free time. But it's not something that I'm, like, really itching to get back to. Because, like you said, it's like a its own version of smash and i've honestly never really been that much into smash yeah i don't know one thing that we aren't for certain is the gta 6 release date it's just rumored that it's going to be coming out next year we did have that first trailer last year so we're just kind of waiting to see what's going to happen if they're going to show another trailer or how far they are in development i for one really hope it does come out next year i do love the gta games that i have played but at the same time i would be okay if they delayed it to 2026, if that means that we get a complete game, because similar to how we've talked before in the podcast, I'd rather them take their time and really finish the game than to just push it out with all these like bug, like get unplayable. So what are you, what are you thinking about GTA? Do you think that it's something that should be just pushed out or if it's something that you think is worth the wait? I think people, I think they should take their sweetest time with it and not really rush the game out. It's been cases where the studio felt pressured to release the game and has done so, and the launch for that game was tremendously terrible. As much as I would love to get my hands on this game and see what happens, I'm going to wait patiently until a lot more of the game has been ironed out. Hopefully, if it releases this year, which is what Rockstar says it's going to, with a possible delay into 2026, Schoolboy Q and T-Pain are involved in GTA 6, whether that be the soundtrack for the game or as guest artists in the game's radio. This one is just one of the things that GTA has always been known for. It's in its modern day Leonida, a fictionalized version of Florida, and player, players will be able to control Lucia and, uh, and an unnamed male that some speculate is named Jason. So yeah, those are my thoughts on GTA 6 and its release. But another game that's set to re be released is Valve's next game. A lot of people want to believe it's uh, Half-Life 3, but it's actually, it's an Overwatch style hero shooter called Deadlock. What, are, what, is, your, what is your opinion on, on hero shooters in general? So are you talking about like the kind of Overwatch style shooter that's getting really popular right now? What's up? Oh, I said, are you talking about like the Overwatch style games that are getting popular right now? Yes. Okay, so I... Have never played Overwatch, but I know. But it's honestly crazy the amount of games that are coming out of this, and now it's turning into its own style of like kind of genre. We have this game, Deadlock, 
We have Marvel Rivals, which is currently in beta or about to have a beta on PlayStation. We have just the just announced Star Wars Hunters, which is like their version of an Overwatch hero shooter, which I'm honestly, I'm okay with. I mean, shit, it, it looks like fun gameplay. I hope that all the other game, that the other two games that I mentioned follow in the footsteps of Marvel Rivals and make it a free to play. And then you can just build on like DLC and stuff for how they get their revenue for the game, which I don't mind because you have that option. But yeah, no, I think those games, there's a lot of creativity that could come from those games because of all the abilities you could use and like the kind of different tactics you could do when you play. So what what are your thoughts on it? I think personally that the hero shooter genre is becoming oversaturated, especially with all the titles you mentioned. You have Overwatch, the first Overwatch, now Overwatch 2, which killed off the first Overwatch, Team Fortress 2, which technically could be considered the first or the precursor to hero shooters. You have Deadlock, Rivals coming out soon, Hunters, Paladins, so I think the genre is getting oversaturated. Deadlock specifically is a third-person based hero shooter with 6v6 battles on big maps with four lanes. There are abilities and items alongside tower defense mechanics. And the setting is described as fantasy with steampunk elements. Something that's also interesting about it is that the elements in the game are familiar to Valve's multiplayer online battle arena or MOBA, such as Dota 2, as well as its own hero shooter with Fortress 2. Other elements are recognizable are from Overwatch, Riot's Valorant, and Smite that are also in the mix. Gabe Newell, the owner of Valve, has yet to announce Deadlock officially. There's a lot of co competition right now in the hero shooter space, so it'll definitely shake up the genre. Hopefully the game performs well. Once again, just like how I talked about the Venom movie, this is a game that will release, but it's not necessarily something that is on my radar. But I'll definitely check it out if it's free. Talking about how the new trend in gaming with the hero shooter, another trend that's also prevalent right now in the gaming industry is like the disappearance of exclusives, specifically with Microsoft and Xbox, as we see Xbox now turn into what is known as Microsoft gaming, because we see the disappearance of exclusives and just going more towards the day one releases for both Xbox and PC. So... I don't know. We've talked about exclusives before and like how important it is for consoles to really separate itself from each other. And I feel like them switching away from that and not focusing on Xbox solely, but rather just being able to get that content out on all Mar Microsoft devices is detrimental to kind of the state of Xbox. And Xbox is admittedly not doing really good <laughs> like right now. And I know for sure the sales on Xboxes are really low compared to PlayStation's. And I feel like that's partly because they've already strayed away from having their own exclusives the same way that PlayStation does. I feel like, yeah, like it, it really is just Microsoft gaming now. Yeah. Um, With according to Games Radar, when they reported on this, they first mentioned the extra context by saying that Microsoft shuttered studios such as Arcane Austin and Tango Gameworks, who they purchased a handful of years ago, where they developed Hi Fi Rush. And their fans more despairing at the thought that even launching a beloved game might not be enough to save a developer from the closure at the hands of Microsoft, the mega corporation. Now, GamesRadar co quoted IGN after speaking with two Xbox co-founders about matters internally at the company and within the context of Microsoft as an overseer and said, I had lengthy conversations with a bunch of Xbox founders and we all came to the same conclusion. It's no longer Xbox. It's Microsoft Gaming which is a shame to hear, as well as something that Esteban mentioned, because uh, further down they said, Microsoft ne never really finished the integration with Bethesda. The founder also points out that Activision was three times the size of Xbox when it was purchased, and Xbox reportedly having almost 30,000 people is proof how vast the company has become, and yet somehow they chose to close down Austin and Tango Gameworks, which is a real shame to see. Xbox has been a staple to gaming as, as a culture. Is it surprising to see this happening? Yes, because it's some, we, me and Esteban, both growing up in the 2000s into the 2010s and being now in our 20s in the 2020s, it's a shed, a brand that was so pivotal in both of our lives, like disappearing overall, becoming less of a brand and more as a service, which is a real shame to see. This is something similar to when it was Atari or Sega and previous game studios that closed down 
and instead decided to concede and put their games out on the consoles that exist today. So just instead of having Sonic on the Sega Genesis or whatever it would be the equivalent to, to in today's time, it's now on Xbox and PlayStation, etc. I think it's also very interesting to see what they're going to do, especially with the games that are going to be com- uh, releasing. I believe that with Game Pass, it's been really good to make a lot of these games that were previously solely on Xbox more accessible to other people, especially on PC. But it has definitely made the idea of buying an Xbox other than brand loyalty from a utilitarian perspective, not necessary. As Esteban mentioned, the idea of exclusives within Xbox is no more as all the games that were Xbox exclusives are now available or accessible on PC and Xbox. The new Xboxes have been outperformed by the sale of the PlayStation 5 due to the prospective exclusives that would be released on the PS5. And ever since the launch of the PS4, you can definitely see the tide turning in the favor of PlayStation and not Microsoft with its lack of exclusives, everything going to Game Pass, and its double-edged sword of accessibility for Xbox players or PC players. It's a shame to see but it's definitely something that's very layered. And I think no real one solution would save Xbox. Like how you were saying, it really is just like a layered kind of thing. But at, the, at this point, is there, Microsoft can't really do anything to save Xbox because of all the... It's just not the same as it was before. Like during the PS3 and Xbox 360 days, when each console had like hundreds of exclusives, now it's down to what, maybe three or four? There isn't anything that differentiates the consoles at least when you're looking at Microsoft's perspective because their exclusives aren't exclusives anymore in the way that, like, PlayStation still has exclusives. I see. But something that is still going to be available across all consoles and PC but is now coming to Game Pass is the latest Call of Duty, Black Ops 6. Esteban, since you've been following the... uh, As you being an avid uh, Xbox fan with the legacy of the 360... What is your take on Black Ops 6 coming to Game Pass? So I, for one, am so excited because that means I don't have to drop $70 at launch. But like how you and I were talking about off the podcast, I feel like what kind of means is that although there isn't going to be a new Game Pass tier system at launch, I feel like there is for sure, without a doubt, going to be an inevitable kind of price increase for Game Pass. And Microsoft can't do this because like, have all the access to every call of duty and those games they could charge as much as they want and they know people are going to be getting them so they don't have to spend the 70 dollars for a new game they'll just have to spend all oh, like 30 a month instead of 70 and then you get access to all these to the the hundreds of games that are on game pass right now so i'm excited for it i do hope that game pass doesn't end up being too expensive because i already think it's it is expensive Especially if you're like me who has Game Pass Ultimate, so you can get the gold subscription, which is like the live service, and then plus Game Pass access to all these games. But I am excited for all the Call of Duties to come on Game Pass, so that way it can revive them. I'm just hoping that they reinforce the servers to push back against the hacking and all those modded servers that exist on those old games. Yeah, we'll we'll have to see what happens. It's it's definitely something to, to see when it comes out. IGN also reported that it's that this week Microsoft announced the arrival of Call of Duty Black Ops 6 Day 1 on Xbox Game Pass is Call of Duty game to do and it follows Microsoft's $69 billion acquisition with Activision Blizzard. Xbox executives have insisted sales could, can be boosted by a game's presence on Game Pass, and yet some of the publishers remain unconvinced. Former Activision boss Bobby Kotick, for example, has always, has always been against putting COD on a subscription service, Microsoft rival Sony who does not release its new exclusive straight to its own subscription service. IGN then stated that specula- speculation is rife that uh, Microsoft plans to make significant changes to Game Pass to accommodate the launch of Black Ops 6 straight into the service. Some have wondered whether Microsoft planned to launch a new, more expensive tier of Game Pass strictly for day one titles, locking the likes of Black Ops 6 behind it, behind it in the process. However, a statement issued to Eurogamer by Microsoft spokesperson ruled that out at least for the launch of Black Ops 6 later this year. And Microsoft stated, Upon launch, Call of Duty Ops 6 will be playable on Xbox and PC for Game Pass Ultimate, PC Game Pass, and Xbox Game Pass for console members. Further down, 
IGN then read more into that statement saying that it's worth digging into what the statement does not say as much as what it does say. For starters, it does not rule out a price hike for any or all tiers currently available to subscribers. The statement leaves room for Microsoft to charge more ahead of the launch of Flop 6 and it feels that it is the correct step. Microsoft to make changes to the existing tiers while making Black Ops 6 available on them at launch. It, it leaves room for that. Mooted changes include the addition of uh, ads, price rises, or a combination of both. Usually Call of Duty games sell for $70 and usually shift around uh, 25 million copies, which amounts to hundreds of dollars in revenue. But releasing it to Game Pass is uh, something Esteban mentioned how he, he can avoid paying for such a game. And they do mention that in IGN saying that launching it straight to Game Pass could uh, cannibalize those sales. Of course, Activision will also launch the across uh, by itself to purchase, as well as PlayStation and PC. But uh, yeah, definitely it seems with uh, Game Pass not attracting enough customers, putting uh, Duty on at launch uh, will definitely help boost Game Pass sales or subscriptions. But it can also damage the amount of revenue that the game can make on launch day. It, it's going to be interesting seeing that as Microsoft has been cutting 100 staff from its uh, gaming businesses, such as the closure of Hi-Fi Rush developer Tango Gameworks and Redfall developer Arcane Austin, with there being more fears of more cuts to come. I could definitely see, like how we mentioned, Game Pass and Microsoft Gaming, instead of uh, evolving from just Xbox Gaming or Xbox, adding Call of Duty to uh, Game Pass is going to be a double-edged sword that will help and also hurt Activision and Microsoft in many ways. I think it's definitely going to be something interesting to see. And a lot of people are looking forward to it as it is being developed by Treyarch, who is known for being the developer that spearheads the most popular games in COD history. I feel like this kind of adds on to what we were talking about before, like about Microsoft gaming. And then it, I don't know, I, like you said, it's, it really is like a double-edged sword. I think it's going to do good, but also do really bad because you are losing out those millions of sales. And I know that they're saying that they don't know if it's going to be able to be as profitable through a subscription service. I would say that it's, I don't know, man, I don't think Xbox could be taking these kind of risks, but as a, as a gamer, I am happy that I'm going to be able to play that game without having to spend all that money at launch. But at the same time, I don't see how this is going to help Microsoft be successful in the long run. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see. The game industry is definitely evolving to this day in very different directions as uh, one could forecast. But yeah, many more things to come that we will report on later in the next episodes. This has been the Wondrous Podcast. I am Retro underscore Loneliness, or Nicholas. And my co-host today, as always, has is... Esteban, known as Estacal. And yeah, we'll, you know, we're going to see what's... Keep you guys updated. Thanks for your time. See you guys. Bye. See you guys.